to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Titus. In our verse-by-verse study through the book of Titus, chapter 3 in Titus and verse 1 and stand with me if you're able Uh, if you're not able please remain seated if you're able please stand with me and follow along at the reading of God's Word down to verse 8 beginning with verse 1 the scripture says put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates to be ready to every good work to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving um, diverse lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing uh, of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Father, we thank you for your word, for its authority, its power, uh, for its penetrating power. Father, may you penetrate our very hearts. We welcome your word into our minds and hearts this morning, asking that as you give to us liberally from the depths of your wisdom, that we'd be willing partakers, uh, anticipating that, not only which we understand through the power of the Holy Spirit, but that which we're also able to exercise in our lives in the days ahead. Be generous and kind to us this morning, allowing us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to understand your word, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. The title of our message comes from uh, verse 8. Uh, maintain good works. In verse 8, uh, in the middle of that verse, um, it says that um, they who have believed in God, those are Christians, saved by God's grace, those who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. So that's the topic of our message, and we'll start uh, back at the first verse, if you will. Uh, to try to understand what God's Word has to say. And there are three things we're going to look at as we do this, and that is that because as a Christian, as a believer, we need to exemplify God in our lives. I use that word exemplify for a particular reason um, because it means to um, to be an example. That's where exemplify comes from. Um, And... Uh, it, it, it simply means that we need to demonstrate on a regular, constant <clears throat> basis the characteristics of God Himself. He saved us, gave us eternal life, and we are now His ambassadors, and we are to do that which God has uh, ordered us to do, and to do everything that we do in accordance with His will, that we might please Him uh, in every way. <clears throat> and that, that maintaining of good works, I've, uh, through the text here, <clears throat> uh, have, have looked at three different things that we'll take a look at today to exemplify godly uh, uh, citizenship. <laughs> Something that is a stranger to a lot of folks today. Exemplify godly citizenship secondly exemplify godly relationships how we get along with other people and thirdly exemplify godly works and to maintain them if you will so going back to the first verse uh, we want to exemplify godly 
citizenship. It says in verse 1, put them in mind. Uh, we, in our Bible study, this earlier this morning, uh, we read in Peter, where Peter said, I'm going to remind you to remember. We need reminders. Uh, here, uh, what we have is Titus being instructed by Paul. Paul is the author here, and he is addressing a pastor named Titus. And Titus um, is, a, is, a, is a pastor, if you will, and Paul is instructing him to do this in such a righteous manner. But he says, put them. Now them uh, are the believers in Crete, where Titus was pastoring, Put them, that is the believers in Crete, that's the direct application of the context. Put those believers in Crete in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. I want to talk about citizenship here because that's what this is, to be subject. Now, uh, the word subject um, is a word that means obey. Very simple. It means obey. We've talked about this word many times. Uh, the word subject is a military term that means to fall in rank under somebody. So uh, the, the context here says the one which we are to obey are the principalities and powers and magistrates. Um, and these, uh, in fact, obey magistrates is one word in the Greek. But the principalities uh, represent the rule in our land. If you watched recently any of the confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominees, um, they talk about the rule of law. Now, that's the way the Supreme Court addresses the laws in our nation, the rule of law. And that rule of law, any issue that, uh, that has a, a, a national implication has to go to the Supreme Court for a ruling if, if, if somebody's challenging the laws that are on the books. And the way the justices decide on what should be, because now somebody's questioning the way it is, somebody's saying it should be done a little differently, maybe it's not what we thought it was. So their job is to go back to our Constitution and to all of the the decisions that have prevailed since then, uh, the history of the Supreme Court, if you will, and of the um, of the um, the federal judicial courts, and they are to take those things and make a decision after having studied what is the rule of law. It's very complicated. Um, I've heard people talk about. Um, uh, I've never been there, but I've heard people talk about experiences in the Supreme Court. And um, even in some of the most pressing or maybe most widespread issues in our land, uh, usually about 20 minutes is all that lawyers have in order to present a case to the Supreme Court. Um, and, it, they, and I'm sure there are exceptions to that, but the average is about 20 minutes. That's all you got. But the purpose is to go to the Supreme Court so that the proper rule of law can prevail in our land. Well, there's one thing outside of our legal system that we know is always right, can never be uh, uh, challenged in any meaningful way, and that's the Word of God. The Word of God is the rule for all people, regardless of who they are. The Bible is applicable to every person, and it is the truth. It is the truth. We did, somebody can't go to God and say, God, you got this wrong. It should be tweaked a little bit to include this. And there are a lot of people who would love to do that, because they're operating outside of God's Word. But the truth is the truth, and there's a word for that. It's called absolute truth. Nothing can take precedence over the Bible. It's absolute it's given. Now, so I use that example of the Supreme Court because that's the law of our land. So we have the Bible and we've got the law of the land. That's not the only law in our land, but the rule of law, the Supreme Court justices try to establish what is the rule of law. And then, of course, there are federal, state, and local authorities under that. And there are a lot of different people that operate on the rule of law in our country. They're from the president, 
you know, all the way down through Congress and through the de different uh, federal authorities that we have over us, including the IRS, the FBI, things like that. And then you come down to the state level and we have state legislatures, we have governors, and we have one down through the state level, various departments, uh, Department of Transportation for our roads. And then you go on down to the local authorities and we have a mayor in our city. I lived in a city up in Michigan and we had a township supervisor, which is just another name for mayor. So we have authorities at all levels in our national structure and local structure from one end to the other that represent not only the people that are serving in the offices, but the things that, that they are to abide by the rule of law. And so this, uh, this authority that's given here in the first verse, uh, the principalities represent the rule of law, if you will, and the powers of those people who are exercising and responsible for that, if you will. And the word, the two words, obey magistrates, literally means to obey one who is in authority. Now, so let's try to put this verse together because we're looking at uh, exemplifying godly citizenship. And the Bible has much to say about it. It's not just what, you know, uh, Paul wrote to Titus, although I will say if this is the only passage we had on the subject, it would still prevail as the truth because it is the truth. Other passages that deal with the same subject verify and authenticate um, and support this passage. But it says here that put them, put the believers in Crete uh, to be subject, that is to obey uh, principalities, the rule of law, the powers, the people that are operating on the rule of law, that have authority, and it says to obey magistrates, that is to obey the ones in authority. That is a command. It says, put them in mind that we need to be obedient to the authorities that are over us. We need to be obedient to those authorities. Um, God has given them to us to be an authority over us. If you look back at Romans chapter 13, if you look at Romans chapter 13, uh, another prominent passage of Scripture that deals with the same thing, and I do want to point these out because when God repeats it, 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 it's, it it's an emphatic statement to us uh, that this is something that we need to remember. Remember, uh, Paul wrote to Titus and says, put your your uh, members in, re in remembrance of these things, that they might remember them. In Romans 13, if you look at verse 1, let every soul, there's no exception. There are no exceptions. I'll give you an example. My wife's uncle years ago lived in a city called Chesapeake, Virginia. We lived in Virginia Beach. It's a neighboring city. Lived in Chesapeake, Virginia, and he had a rural piece of property, and they came through and put water lines uh, between uh, down the roads and streets and made it mandatory to hook up to city water. Everybody was on a, uh, uh, you know, on a, uh, what do you call it, on a system where they had to pump the water out of the ground, right? So they all had, so here, so here now all of a sudden we got city water coming through. Well, this guy was adamant. He was adamant he was not going to hook up to city water. Not going to do it. And he didn't do it. And he resisted and resisted and resisted and resisted. And eventually came to the point where he considered it uh, to be so important to maintain his stand that he actually moved from there to the state of Maine where he could dig another well and live off his own well water. He was just adamant he was not going to obey the authorities where he lived. It's wrong. It's wrong. It says here in the scriptures in Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject, the word means to obey, under the higher powers, that is the authorities over us, for there is no power, there's no authority from the president to our local council person, to the police, to the fire, to whoever they are, to the employees at City Hall, they have vested authority and power from the city, from the state, from the federal government. It says for there, the reason is, the word for means why. Why every soul should be obedient to the authority that's over them because there is no power, there's no authority, but of God. The powers that be, 
the ones that now exist in our community and in our land from the local to the national level, it says the powers that be are ordained of God. They're ordained of God. So I don't like the authority over me. The scripture has no provision for that. <laughs> There's no provision for that. You're going rogue on God when you do that. You say, I don't like the president. Well, I don't like the governor. Well, I don't like the mayor. I don't like, you know, the, the policeman that comes and patrols our neighborhood. I don't, we don't have a right to not like them. What we're commanded to do is to obey them. There's no exception given. Romans 13, 1 says, let every soul obey. And then verse 2 says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. When you resist, now think about this. There is, a, there is a political party in our country. I don't get into politics, but I get into biblical applications. There is a political party in our country that their motto and theme from day one, uh, two years ago, was resist. Resist the president. Resist everything. And yet they call themselves Christians. How do they get from being a Christian to disobey uh, authorities in verse 1 here and in verse 2, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, judgment. Scriptures are clear. When we begin to resist the authority over us, we're resisting God. Now we all understand that we're never required to do anything that runs against the grain of Scripture. Never. We're always to be in conformance with Scripture. So the law can, uh, the, the law can be that it's legal to have a homosexual marriage, that it's legal to do that. Uh, we don't have to do it, and we don't do it. We still have to respect the authorities not to respect the law because the law represents disobedience to God. It's nonconformance to the word of God. But what we can do is we can exercise our right as citizens of the United States to vote next time there's an election. To try to put somebody in the office that might conform to the word of God. But understand that that authority that now exists that has said that it's okay to do that, it's okay to abort babies, that is, there's no authority except that which God has ordained. There are a lot of evil people out there. There's a lot of evil and wicked uh, things that have eventuated out of government activity from top to bottom. We understand that. There's police people out there, they shouldn't even have a badge on. I understand that. Um, it doesn't mean that they're totally bad, but it means that they, they probably do things that he shouldn't be wearing a badge for. And so there are exceptions to almost everything, but we are to obey the authorities that are over us. Now, if the authority comes in and puts a gun to our head and say, you need to reject Jesus Christ as your savior, not going to do that, right? Not going to do that. So we're not going to do the things that run contrary to scripture. But if it doesn't run contrary to Scripture, we need to respect and honor, the Scripture says, respect and honor the authorities that are above us, not to resist them. And in verse um, 4, um, it talks about, well, verse 3 here in Romans 13, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil wilt thou then not be afraid of the power. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For, it, for he, that is the ones who have authority over us, um, as the minister of God, and it says to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, uh, and an avenger there, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, means obedient, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. And that's the conscience that says, we're not going to do that which is contrary to God's word, even though the authority tells us that. In verse 6, for this cause pay ye tribute also, um, uh, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their, to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, 
Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Okay, now, that being said, <clears throat> look, if you will, at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Another uh, passage that talks about this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13, the Scripture says there, um, Submit yourselves, there's that same word, means to obey, be obedient to, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors <clears throat> as unto them that are sent by him <clears throat> for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God. <clears throat> it's God's will that we resist, not the authorities, but that we obey them. For with well-doing, if we're looking at exemplifying and maintaining good works, we need to do well in the sight of the Lord. So we need to, <clears throat> it says with well-doing in verse 15 here, uh, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. <clears throat> now we go back to our text over here in Titus. <clears throat> excuse me. Go over here to uh, the book of Titus in verse 1 again. Put them in mind to be subject, to be obedient to the authorities over them, <clears throat> to obey the ones in authority, and at the end of verse 1, to be ready <clears throat> to every good work. To be ready to every good work. The word ready means prepared. Prepared. Uh, we should be prepared. Peter wrote <clears throat> that we should be always prepared to give an answer of every reason of the reason for the hope that is in us. Give that answer to everybody. So we need to be ready. That is prepared to do that. And we're prepared, if you will, through a study of God's word, uh, through a devotion to God's word. After we have submitted ourselves to the Lord in faith and received the free gift of salvation. It's our obligation to God. It's a mandate that we obey the authorities over us. And in that way, and only in that way, uh, can we exemplify godly citizenship. Otherwise, we're doing our own thing, and we're going rogue on God. Um, and because we're actually living in a period where rejection of authority is not only encouraged, not only is popular, uh, but it's applauded in so many ways. It's applauded in so many ways. And uh, in, in our particular country, where, where <clears throat> we have two very strong political parties that are opposing each other, uh, we find that happening on both sides of the aisle, they call it. <clears throat> That's why we need to divorce ourselves of the politics and get straight to the Word of God and be children of God. That's, and people ask who you are, it's not whether you're of this party or that party, you're a child of God. And a child of God will do what God says. And God says, obey the authorities that are over us. We understand political parties can have huge influence and sometimes you get caught up in the array of politics and in all the persuasion that goes with it. And if you don't think that's true, that's why they get on these buses and fly on these planes and get on these trains to go to places so they can have big meetings, bring people in and try to purport their beliefs and what they want to, 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 to te talk about dogmatically so that you follow what they want. Um, and one thing I learned working for an automotive manufacturer is uh, unions are, are very prevalent and uh, it's, a, it's a political structure within the union and people will fight and battle and struggle in order to get some kind of authority. Not everybody, but there are people that will do that. And so they get authority over people. Um, and it's a, it's a power-hungry battle in so many cases. And that's why I believe it's, it's not... I don't think it's even possible for a true Christian uh, to go out and get a bunch of votes. <laughs> it's hard to get votes unless you compromise your stand on the Word of God. Because that which is just and right and in accordance with Scripture is not going to be popular among the people. Uh, people who get votes, a lot of votes, are people who are popular among people. We need to be obedient to God and pleasing to him. Our job is not to be popular to people, tell them what they want to hear so we can get a vote, get an office, and do things that we have our own agenda for. So let's, if you will, exemplify godly citizenship. 
The next is exemplify godly relationships. We see that in verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> and there's a comma at the end of verse 1. So we are to be ready to every good work. And that thought continues into verses 2 and 3. And it tells us that what we are to do, and this is relationships at all levels in our life with all people. And it says that we are to speak evil of no man. Uh, this means to blaspheme or to slander, if you will. We're not to slander. And, and the thought behind this word is to be injurious or to try to harm somebody. It's with malicious intent, if you will. That's the idea of speaking evil of people. To be no brawlers, uh, not to be contentious, or to be one who is combative. Not to be contentious or combative. This is in relationships with people in general. We can still share the gospel and not slander people. We can still share the gospel and not be combative and contentious. We can still live the, the, the life that God wants us to live. We can still please the Lord. We can still accomplish His will in leading people down a path of salvation that they might understand the truth of the Word. We cannot be pleasing to God if we avoid talking about sin. Can't be pleasing to God if we do that. You say, well, I need to be positive with everybody. Well, we need to be truthful with everybody. Truthful with everybody. And there's a difference. We need to be truthful. Because being positive takes on connotations in the mind of the person who says the word. It's like beauty. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. right? And positivity is in the eyes of the thinker. So whatever you think is positive will be positive to you. If we think in terms of the truth, then we'll get it right. But we have to have the truth in order to get it right. So we're not going to speak evil. We're not going to be uh, contentious or be brawlers. But on the contrary, we'll be gentle, gentle. And, you know, this word means uh, peaceable, if you will, uh, equitable. And perhaps a, a, a good example of this is forbearing. Give you a, a good example of forbearance. Um, I was 30 years old when I got saved. God was forbearing. What did I deserve? I deserved uh, early death and I deserved uh, a grave and, and, and an, an appointment in hell itself, in the lake of fire. That's what I deserved. But God was gracious and he was forbearing. And he was forbearing and, 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 and prodded me called me. I can't tell you how many times that I was drawn in the right direction and I turned back. I was drawn and I turned back. Finally, I got into a church. The Lord harnessed me into a church. Uh, and, and what happened is I got convicted from the word of God by a preacher. And, and it was that conviction that came back a couple of weeks later when I went there and God convicted me and then I surrendered my life. But we've got to be careful because God was forbearing until I was 30 years old. He was forbearing he didn't punish me when he could have. Some people, my, my father-in-law got saved when he was 66 years old. That's the way God works. God will save people. He's forbearing. Aren't we thankful God is forbearing? Because otherwise, when we came to the age of accountability, whatever that age is, the only example I'm aware of in Scripture, can't be dogmatic about that's the age, but in the, children, in, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, God... Uh, took out all of the people that were 20 years and older and killed them. And all those that were 20 and under weren't. So that seemed like they weren't accountable for what was going on. But everybody over the age of 20 was. I don't know what the age is. Some people say it's 12 years old. Well, you know what? You've got to go outside of the Bible to find that. And I don't believe you can be dogmatic about 20 years of age. But at whatever point in time we became accountable for our sins... God could have just wiped us out and said, you know, I've given you three chances. I gave you 10 opportunities to receive Christ as your Savior by faith, and you failed every time. You're out of here. No, God's a loving God, and so he's forbearing. As believers, sometimes we look at other people who are sinners, and we say, how in the world can you not believe the truth? Why haven't they turned to the Lord? We ought to look in the mirror and talk to ourselves that way sometimes. Say, so why did I wait so long? How is it I couldn't see the truth? Then we'd understand. But sometimes when we walk in somebody else's shoes, we've already been there. We've already passed over that threshold by the grace of God as He gave us the gift of salvation. They haven't put their faith in Christ yet. They don't know. 
Maybe they do know when they've resisted. We don't know when the Lord's going to judge them. But what we do know is it's coming at some point in time. It may be after their death, but death is a result of sin. And we're all born in iniquity. So God was forbearing to allow me to live long enough for him to get my attention, for me to put my faith in Christ. And for that, I'm eternally grateful and thankful to God. So we need to be uh, gentle. That's forbearing is, a, is another word that has similar meaning. And showing all meekness unto all men. And the word meekness means humility, if you will. And it's not the um, outward behavior only, but it's the inward grace of the soul that motivates us to be humble in the sight of other people. And we are to be exemplary in our relationships with other people. And these things have to be in place for that to happen. And in verse 4, but after the kindness and love of God our Savior uh, toward, uh, excuse me, in verse 3, but for we ourselves also were sometimes, that word sometimes means before, once before, if you will, uh, at one time, we were once foolish, we were, and the first word for tells us why, why uh, we should treat others the way verse 2 describes to us. Why? Because we were in their shoes at one time. We were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers as his various kinds of lusts and desires, uh, unhealthy and ungodly and wicked desires, and pleasures, living in malice and with an envy, hateful and hating one another. We've been there. That's the way we used to live our life. And everybody's different on the scale of each one of those. But all of those characteristics apply. And if we've been in those categories, we need to understand, okay, that's how I used to be. But guess what? I'm not the same person anymore. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Yeah, I used to act that way, but I don't act that way anymore because God saved me out of that. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, and go down to verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, key word is if. <laughs> if. People go right on by that word. If requires faith. Faith in Christ. It means we have surrendered. We have, we have devoted ourselves to God. We trust Him. Our confidence is not in ourselves any longer. It's in God. <clears throat> if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That is a new creation. If we are in Christ, we're a new creation. We've been created anew. John talked to, um, to Nicodemus. I mean, Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, you must be born again. It only comes by faith. And he says here, old things are passed away. What are the old things? Titus chapter 3 and verse uh, 3. Those are the old things. The hatred, the animosity, the pride, all of that stuff is gone. It is passed away. It means it's dead. Sin no longer has dominion over us. It did have dominion over it. In fact, we were enslaved to sin before we got saved by the grace of God. But it no longer has dominion. That stuff has passed away. And it says at the end of verse 17, Behold, all things are become new. Look at verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Whoa. We are ambassadors for Christ. That means we're representatives. We're no longer ourselves. A person that is employed as an ambassador for a, a cause or for a country, uh, they are required to be devoted uh, to developing uh, uh, whatever uh, the nation stands for or the cause is to that to everybody else. And they represent that as an ambassador. That's who we are with Christ. We're an ambassador of Christ. We go back to our text over in Titus. So what we find is the reason we should be um, uh, gentle and with humility before other people is we've been there. We've been there in verse 3 of Titus 3. And so what we find then is um, 
And that's the relationships with other people. And the last of the time, I want to talk about exemplify godly works. After all, the topic of our message and the theme of this particular passage found in verse 8 is be careful to maintain good works. So, in verse 4, uh, Paul goes on to write to Titus, says, but after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, that is through the incarnate Christ and his sacrifice at Calvary, um, it says, now by works of, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, because that righteousness is self-righteousness. In other words, we can't go and accomplish salvation by just turning over a new leaf and changing our life. And you see, there are lots of people who say, oh, I'm a new person. I'm a different person. I'm a new person. You're only a new person in God's eyes if you've been saved by his grace. Otherwise, we have... It's fake news that we're a new person. It's a popular phrase today, fake news. It's fake news. We're not new. We might do things differently, but we're still the same old sinner we used to be <clears throat> until we're saved by the grace of God. So in, um, in verse 5, we understand it, salvation is not by works that we do, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. <clears throat> by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's that renewed life. Behold, all things are new. The way we think is new. The way we act is new. The way we behave is new. What we consider as priorities is new. How we, how we develop our relationships is new. Everything about us is new. It's not according to our works, but by the saving grace of God. And then in verse 6, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The, the, the greatest example of love is Christ going to the cross, taking your sins and my sins upon His shoulders and paying the price for sin. Romans chapter 3 says, for the wages, that is the price of sin, is death. And we understand that there's no remission. So why did Christ go to the cross? That he might redeem people from their sins. And we understand that there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So Christ had to take our sins, one who knew no sin. This is great love. Christ took our sins, who knew no sin, never did anything that was sinful. And he took them to the cross, shed his blood, died for us, and then rose again. And had victory over death. So that the promise of eternal life to us has real meaning and validity. It's evidence of our eternity. And we find that given uh, to the scripture. So being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So knowing all of that, how we should behave and, and, and towards our, the authorities over us, how we should behave in relationship to people. Right? Now uh, we find that in general, through all of this, there's one constant thread, and it's works. Works do not save us, but once we're saved, works are mandatory. And so uh, there are people who get saved, and for some period of time, it could be six months, it could be six years, it could be 60 years. They go and they do all these great things. At some point in their life, whether they're at 20, 40, 60, 80, or 100 years old, they stop maintaining good works. I'm done. The Lord's not done with us until our last breath has been breathed. I had a, a preacher friend of mine um, play softball with and he, we were out on the, the ball field last week. I played, I played a game last week out on the ball field. And he was on the team we were playing against. And after the game, he came up to me and he said, you know what? Because he retired twice from different churches. He retired twice. And the Lord's called him to pastor another church. And he accepted the call. He didn't go out seeking this. The Lord drew him in. And now he's pastoring that church. And at the, the confirmation vote was the Sunday before. He comes to me and he pulls me aside. He says, you know, he said, I have to confess to the Lord and to you. He says, I've used that word retire when I shouldn't have used it. He said, I can't retire from ministry. 
He said, I can't do that. He said, so I'm back serving as the pastor of this church. I said, well, good for you. I said, good for you. Because you, we don't need to give up. We don't need to give up. There's a place for us to serve. No matter where we are, no matter what capabilities we think we have, or disabilities we believe we have, or actually have, God isn't done with us yet until He takes us home. He's got us here for a reason. We're here for a reason. As His children, we're ambassadors of Christ. And until the day we die, we need to be that ambassador maintaining good works. I know some people that in their last years, they become bitter and cruel perhaps to their family, to the people around them. I understand there are people that have mental conditions and they can't control that. I'm not talking about that kind of behavior. But I'm talking about people who have consciously done this uh, because they're not happy where they are. They're not happy. Well, well verse 8 says, This is a faithful saying. Uh, not only is it true, uh, but we need to abide by it. And these things I will that thou affirm. Affirm means to make sure of, and we need to, in our lives, stress them firmly and, and, and give all credence to them so that they rule over our life. And we were to affirm constantly, there <clears throat> should be no wavering in this commitment, that they who have believed in God, remember we read over in first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, if you have believed in God, then you're a new creation. And here it says <clears throat> as well um, that they who have believed in God. So here the if is gone because these are people who have put their faith in Christ. Now, as a believer, we fall in this category that they who have believed in God, God's got something to say to us. What is it? Be careful to maintain good works. <clears throat> the word maintain... Uh, really comes from the idea in, in the Greek to make an occupation of something. To make an occupation of something. And, and to do it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a godly manner. But to make an occupation. We need to make an occupation of doing works for the Lord. Because that is our occupation. We have, time, we have thoughts that occupation means it's our job. Uh, and that's the job we go to from 8 to 5 or work to midnight shift or... You know, whatever it might be. But we have a responsibility to God, mentioned it this morning, to be good stewards of, of what He's given to us. Whether it's our resources, our talents, our time, whatever it is, we are to be good stewards of that which we have. God doesn't call anybody to sort of sit back and just ride it out for the last few years of life. Doesn't call anybody to do that. So it not only applies to those at the end of their life, but those at the beginning of their Christian experience and those everywhere in between. All of us experience a period of time in our life where there's a lull in our maintenance of good works. It becomes a lull in our life. And we need to, we need to catch it quickly and we need to address it quickly in a godly manner. So that we're not remiss in performing the obligations we have towards God. And the scripture is full of these things. Full of things that we are to do. There's commandment after commandment after commandment. And I believe that we fall into a lull of activity of good works when we're not close to the word of God. James says, God says, draw nigh to him and he'll draw nigh to us. How do we draw nigh to God? God's Word is what we have. We need to draw close to God's Word. If we're going to maintain good works, we can't just keep doing what we've been doing, the same way we've been doing it with the same people we've been doing it with. God has a dynamic plan for each and every person's life. And the maintenance of good works, sometimes we, we sort of wiggle our way in our Christian life and we come to a comfort zone. And we come to that comfort zone and, and maybe it's in our, our, the duties we perform for the Lord, the service we perform for the Lord, the people we interact with, whatever that might be. And all of a sudden we come into a lull of activity and we feel we're right in the center of God's will. When in fact we've sort of been, um, we've been lullabied into a sleep and an apathetic condition 
Jesus addressed those people over in Revelation when he wrote the letters to the churches. And he said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. You're just sort of apathetic. You're not doing anything. <clears throat> you're doing a lot of things, but you're not doing the right things. You're busy, but you're not doing the Lord's work. You're not performing the Lord's will. And, you know, um, Jesus was quoted by Matthew in chapter 7 of that gospel. And it says that those uh, that, that people can know that they are believers if they're doing the will of God. You say, well, I'm doing God's will. Well, how do you know that? Well, I believe I am. How do you know that? You got to go to the word to find out if you're doing God's will. So I think what happens is there's a disconnect between us and the word by way of a healthy study of the word to constantly be in the word, to, to pray and to meditate and study day in and day out. And, and, and to put nothing above that priority and it doesn't mean that it needs to be the most consuming by way of time, but it needs to be the most important by way of priority. And if it's important by way of priority, we're going to find time for it. I haven't had time to study the Bible in three weeks. Where did that come from? It comes from a lackadaisical attitude where we've come into a lull of activity and we're not maintaining good works. Because God will move and stir us. You know, these things that Peter wrote, he says, I want to put you in remembrance of this. And why do we have all these commands to the believers? We have commands because we get off track. We need to constantly main. We're not perfect. We can't read the Bible, understand all that stuff we got and say, okay, I don't need that anymore. I got it. Now we can do that to some secular topics, right? I mean, I studied algebra and, and, and physics and I studied uh, um, uh, a higher math in college. I don't use very little of that anymore. I've, I don't. I haven't been back to an algebra book book since I built a deck in Virginia Beach, and that was 31 years ago this year. That's the last time I looked at my algebra book. So I can get by with that, and I have. But I can't go 31 years without looking in the book, God's Word. I've got a. This should be my top priority. I can learn some subjects, and I can do it. My experience and skill and stuff. But I need to be diligent about the Word of God. If I'm going to maintain good works, i got to know what they are. And i got to have these minds, oh, I haven't put enough emphasis here. Haven't put enough emphasis there. And I want to close with this thought over in uh, Ephesians, uh, excuse me, Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. And we can, sum, we can sum this maintaining good works up here. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true. Now, sometimes our idea or opinion of what's true can get warped over time and get sidetracked by listening to things that are going on in the world, by paying attention in the, to the media, to electronics, to TV, to computers, to cell phones, iPods, iPads. All of those things can distract us, our neighbors, our friends. Uh, our work associates, they can distract us. But here it says, we, whatever things are true, the truth is contained in God's word. It's the absolute truth. We have to always go back to the source of truth to understand. And it's true of every area of our life. So whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are um, lovely here, Whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue. If we're going to have virtue before the Lord, that means excellence, excellence. If we're going to have excellence before the Lord, if there's any excellence, any. God's words, not mine. It says there, at the, uh, at the, towards the end of verse 8, if there be any virtue or excellence, and if there be any praise, praise of God. Think on these things. Think on these things. And then in verse 9, thinking on these things leads to verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. We cannot have peace with God until we maintain good works. We can't have peace with God until we maintain good works. If we believe that we can go rogue on God and we don't need to give it as much attention and focus as we used to, 
Or maybe we never really got to the level where God's pleased with our life. We just sort of got on board and, and we're living our life. And we're not doing the things we used to do. There's a lot more to Christianity than that. We need to be ambassadors for Christ. That means that God has responsibilities for us. And we have to fulfill those responsibilities, privileges of service. And when we do, the scripture says we're going to suffer because of it. And we're going to suffer for right doing. We're going to suffer for doing things right. And in those times, we can rejoice and be exceeding glad. And that's when we're at peace with God is when, the, when all the negativity around us does not distract us from faithful service to God. Maintain good works is essential. And in order to do that, we have to have the effect. We have to be effectively a good citizen. We have to have effective relationships with others. And we've got to keep on that track of maintaining those good works. Let's stand together, if you will. Father, we thank you for giving to us your word today. And as we have studied your word, may our, our minds continue to dwell upon the thoughts and, and how our life stacks up against your expectations. Lord, we'd be remiss if we left here today and did not examine our own lives to see where we fall in the spectrum of maintaining good works. As you have laid out in your word, not according to our own uh, thinking or opinions. So may we, may we strive to be those ambassadors uh, for Christ that is truly serving Christ in all that we do so that what we do glorifies and lifts you up, exalts you and praises you and brings you glory and honor, not ourselves. And as we go our own way uh, here from our service today, uh, may our thoughts continue around how we can be the faithful servant that you expect us to be. We'll give you praise and thanks for all that you do in our life. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.